Our guest today is Jada Kunjer. Jada, how are you? Very good, David. Nice to meet you. Welcome back to the show. Yep, thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been, I guess, well, two years. We just meet. Maybe we've known each other for, what, 20 years, maybe? Yes. <laughs> uh, we met in Seattle. I actually remember when we met. We met in Seattle. Yeah. In uh, Alaska, at that hotel. Uh, at, uh, yeah. At the, the flyback for Avanade. A uh, lot less gray hair that uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looked good, though. Yeah, exactly. Let me show them. What are you doing these days? So, uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm still uh, working with NK Tech, and uh, we are a Microsoft Gold partner, um, primarily focused on applications development. Um, we do a lot of uh, custom software development uh, for our clients, uh, specifically in Azure development, uh, Azure integration services, um, and we also now have uh, uh, applications that have a significant user interface component. Um, so we build a UI that uh, users can use and uh, uh, web-based applications, mobile applications, uh, IoT and other things uh, uh, for you know process control kind of applications, logistics applications. So we have kind of fanned out from our initial focus on you know BizTalk server, which we still have. Uh-huh. We've kind of spread out now into custom.net and uh, Azure. Okay, yeah, that's a lot. I, I, I've known you when you were a BizTalk guy, and you've always stayed with that integration thing. In fact, today you, you're hosting the Global Integration In Bootcamp. Bootcamp. Tell me about that. So this is an annual event. Uh, the, the Global Integration Bootcamp is something that we have on, uh, on a Saturday uh, all around the world. So we are hosting the Chicago event. Uh, there are other uh, integration uh, MVPs, uh, uh, most valuable players, that are hosting them in Europe, in Australia, in India. So um, uh, we all collaborate and uh, you know try to use this annual event to um, basically uh, let folks know what's happening in the Microsoft integration space, specifically around some of Microsoft's integration products such as you know, the Microsoft Integration Service Engine, the uh, API management, service bus, event grid, uh, logic apps, Azure Functions, all of those kinds of things are technologies that are evolving and we use this event to you know, tell um, uh, attendees uh, you know, what's happened since the last time we met and also do some demos, uh, do, do some hands-on labs so that at the end of the day they feel that they've learned you know, something and they also have a lot of code that they can take with them and implement in their, you know, in their problems. Great. It seems to be going well. I just we just left the room and yeah. somebody's giving a talk on durable functions right now. As your durable functions, People exactly. Are in rapt attention, uh, and you gave a talk. Um, yours was more broad. You covered yes. a bunch of topics. Tell me Great. about what you spoke about. So I spoke about uh, API management, um, logic apps, service bus, and event grid. Uh, we talked about logic apps when we were on the show last time, a couple of years ago. Uh, let's let's dive into some other things. Yeah. So logic apps has evolved. Uh, it, it's now you know used. Uh, uh, by us in at least uh, uh, you know a couple of scenarios, and uh, I'll, I'll just talk uh, about the business scenario that uh, uh, is is you know enabling is enabled with Logic Apps. Um, but you know before I get to the business case, I think there's a lot of uh, improvements they've made as far as the number of connectors are concerned, mm-hmm. uh, the entire integration with Visual Studio. So as developers, uh, you know our tool of choice is Visual Studio. Um, and uh, with Logic Apps completely integrated with Visual Studio, it's easy for us to build and you know design, deploy, create templates, you know test locally, deploy to Azure, all of that using Visual Studio, and that is a huge improvement, uh, you know that uh, that they've made. And I think uh, you, used to the, you had to do that development in the browser. Yes, you had to do that in the browser a couple of years ago, uh, but required yeah. an internet connection, but also it made version control harder. Correct. You know, so so the entire uh, experience is a lot easier now. So that's why we've been able to adopt it a lot more easily, and allows us to solve a lot of uh, you know integration challenges, uh, whether it's hosted on the cloud or hosted on premise. And and some of the newer things that were announced by the Microsoft team around probably several you know six months ago or nine months ago was the integration service engine, where you could run Logic Apps on premise instead of running it in the cloud, yeah. and that is going to be. Uh, uh, another very valuable tool, um, you know, that will help some customers who want to use the same platform when they're building solutions in the cloud and and also building solutions on-prem. 
you know, if you're using logic apps and APM management in cloud-based scenarios, you, you know, you might want to use the same thing oh, you know, so on-prem. It's not Instead just, of BizTalk, right, you could use that yeah. oh, okay. yeah. service yeah. engine. Yeah. BizTalk is, is more complex and, and more expensive, I think, than logic apps. Yeah, I, I think it's more, uh, more you know, uh, of uh, going with uh, of what uh, developers are, are used to. So if they've okay. developed using Visual Studio and built logic apps, for our cloud applications, they can continue using those skills. Uh, why retrain them? And, and BizTalk also, we had a very interesting talk on BizTalk from uh, Microsoft, and that has also evolved uh, so that uh, with BizTalk 2020, uh, a lot of the features that they've added allow it to have a much, much uh, uh, longer life, more relevance. Hmm. You know, they have integrated it with API management. They already had Logic Apps integration in BizTalk 2016. Uh, but you know the service bus integration was already there in 2016. But they made it, you know, connected. To, you know, you could connect it uh, to uh, a lot of different uh, REST APIs, support for JSON, um, a lot of uh, support for application insights. Um, so that BizTalk 2020 is also evolved, and I think one of the uh, things I've heard from uh, the Microsoft team is that you know um, BizTalk uh, 2020 is a release. And BizTalk is going to be supported till at least uh, 2030. So you're looking at 10 years wow. uh, of support. Uh, so people who are using BizTalk today shouldn't really worry about it too much because 10 years is quite a long time horizon, you know, for it is, yeah. for you to to think about and not have to worry about, you know, uh, BizTalk moving out of support anytime soon. Yeah, it's interesting that they're still adding features after uh, over 20 years. This product. Correct. Now. Correct, and the interesting thing that we heard is that you know it is still used in a lot of mission critical applications. Right. It is used uh, by the U.S. government uh, in many different applications. I believe Microsoft also uses it inter internally in the Treasury Department. So BizTalk is going to be you know something that um, it still has a long life, in my opinion. Okay. But we've evolved into other applications. So if I could go into some a couple of use cases. I'm not that. Okay. So what, we were talking about logic apps. So one of the use cases that we've implemented um, is for a logistics company where they have a warehouse management system and uh, they have customers who are international customers that um, have a, a warehouse uh, run by another supplier in Chicago. So basically, the uh, uh, they have uh, you know the manufacturing facility out in Europe. And they would like uh, the warehouse management system here in Chicago to deliver locally, you know, in the Midwest. So we have built logic apps that uses like the SFTP adapter or connector to connect to the international shippers' um, FTP site, and we can pull, you know, the item master, which lists all the products that, uh, you know, they are going to be sending to the warehouse. So we have integrated the item master, the purchase order, sales orders with um, the warehouse management system, uh, CargoWise One warehouse management system, which is CargoWise is a product that a lot of logistics companies use to manage warehouses. So using Logic Apps, we were able to come up uh, pretty quickly with a solution that pulls uh, all this information from um, you know, the international uh, F FTP site Use Logic Apps to map, you know, the all these different uh, uh, purchase orders, uh, item master sales orders into a CargoWise format, mm -hmm. and then call the CargoWise API to update, you know, the internal warehouse management system so that the customer could then, you know, looking at the warehouse, looking at what purchase orders have to get fulfilled, you know, uh, use CargoWise to go ahead and deliver all the products to the customer. But the interesting thing is. We built the middleware tier using a cloud-based solution mm -hmm. and a subscription-based model. So you know, we didn't have to look at upfront installing, you know, some software or hardware on on the premises. I mean, this this customer uh, is basically not having to invest in any physical hardware right. or memory or CPU or anything. Basically, we built an integration <coughs> solution completely in Azure mm -hmm. using Logic Apps. Uh, perfect. That sounds like an ideal case for the cloud. <laughs> right. Uh, tell me about some of these other tools that are uh, that you're using, the integration tools. In so the other one that we've used is uh, API management. Mm -hmm. So API management. So today, you know, the uh, we we look at the API economy where, you know, 
a lot of companies are monetizing some of the assets that they have by uh, opening it up using an API okay. because they have you know information they might have you know uh, build uh, you know uh, data models for example that uh, would be useful for other other people to be using it could be you know as far as uh, uh, you know, risk uh, assessment is concerned. It could be some, some you know, applications of that sort where you know you've invested over twenty years of uh, technology in in building something, and then some part of it uh, can be monetized. Uh, you know, to allow you to sell it. So you can build an API that allows outsiders to call that API. Of course, APIs have existed for a long time. You know, we've all built APIs. You know, that allow you to. Uh, call that service from from somewhere outside, yeah. but in, the difference in before the web we had correct, exactly. So, but the difference between what we use now with the API management is that uh, you know the API allows uh, your end users who are going to consume the API to to test the API using whatever language they prefer to use, whether it's C sharp or Node.js or Python. You know they can they can uh, test it very quickly because. API management in Azure allows you to, you know, it generates a swagger code and allows you to actually look at, you know, uh, calling the API in, in different formats. I don't have to write, okay, this is how you would call my API using C Sharp, or this is how you would call it. I don't have to do any of that. It kind of generates what that. What is a swagger file? Swagger is basically, you know, like in the old days, we used to call it WSDL, Web Services Definition Language. Right. So swagger is now the, the, the way API management uses you know, uh, it's the interface that defines the web service. Okay. So that's what it, it, it generates a swagger and allows you to actually look at it using different, um, you know, languages that you can interface with it. And then the other benefit that API management gives you is the security aspect of it. Okay. You can control, you know, uh, the front end security. They have, you know, uh, one way to, you can call the API using like a SaaS token, which uh, if, if you don't have that token, then you, you know anyone calling that API is going to get a failure, and then on the back end, you know you can define other security models or the, you know whatever Active Directory, mm -hmm. Azure Active Directory. Uh, so you can define uh, security models in different ways on the front end and the back end, and then you can also throttle different kinds of requests that are coming in. Mm -hmm. You know uh, you could uh, you know have a whole bunch of different policies that you can define on the API. So we built this API on the front end that allows. Um, a customer to basically do a, a file upload, file download, or a get file, which is basically a backup of a database. They could use the API uh, to, to you know uh, save a backup to OneDrive, mm -hmm. and and then they can also retrieve a particular file from OneDrive. And the only additional twist was that when they load a file up into OneDrive, they have several different parameters. Uh, like they have the customer, they have the ship to, sold to, application information. So based on that, uh, the API, uh, you know, uh, was calling a logic app with these parameters, mm -hmm. and then the logic app goes and connects with OneDrive using a OneDrive connector, mm -hmm. and then it saves that file in a particular folder based on some of the metadata that has been passed nice. in the call, and and then when the customer does, you know, a, a get file from Let's say they they're sitting out in the field uh, on the you know let's say it's uh, they're on an IoT device and they want to you know retrieve a particular backup file mm -hmm. you, you know they can again call this API that we've given them they can use the, the, the token the SAS token inside the controller and then they can actually retrieve that file and you know download it into the controller and boot up the controller and then the other advantage is if they're logged into the you know to their uh, network using their workstation. Mm -hmm. Because OneDrive maps to your local, you know, laptop drives, uh, it's very easily accessible to them. Because once someone has uploaded a backup to OneDrive, everyone who's connected to OneDrive, you know, for that particular uh, account, are able to, you know, access the backups that they need. They can copy it over to a USB if they wanted to. Mm. They can do all of that. But the API management was the front end part of it that allows us to do security, and then we had. Uh, an Azure app service behind that calling a logic app and then the logic app was calling uh, you know the OneDrive connector. Interesting. So all of that was what we demonstrated today also as part of our API management session. Yeah, and I remember one other technology you talked about was EventGrid. Correct. So EventGrid is another very useful technology. It allows you to do 
So in, in you know, the BizTalk world, we always talk about BizTalk as a published subscribe model, mm -hmm. where you have a bunch of publishers who, you know, uh, write to a particular, uh, uh, in our case, uh, in, in the BizTalk world, write to, to the database, mm -hmm. then you had a bunch of subscribers. Right, here was a bus. So the event grid is also a pub sub where you could have, um, you know, many people, um, you know, sending data into the event grid and then the event grid has subscribers who, who are requesting certain events to be notified when certain events occur. And the other big advantage of event grid is, you know, a lot of, lot of us have written code where we are polling a particular database to say, hey, you know, uh, tell me if something changed, you know, uh, every, every minute I'm going to poll to get some information. Whereas event grid is based on an eventing model where mm -hmm. when something happens, the event grid gets the event and then it can route it, you know, uh, to a logic app or it can route it to another API call. So it allows you to have this uh, middle tier that allows you many different kinds of inputs mm -hmm. with, that are published events and then many different kinds of outputs that are subscribers of the events. And like I said, subscribers could be a whole host of you know, uh, a whole host of things. It could be, uh, you know, uh, IoT devices, APIs, you know, uh, many, many different things. So it's a very versatile um, uh, a mechanism to, you know, to develop event-driven code. Okay, so I guess I think the, you mentioned is a, you contrast it with polling, and I think the difference is, as I understand it, that with something like event grid, you're, you're essentially the, the middleware is pushing that information out to a, exactly. to, a to a destination, whereas with polling, the the destination is asking, is the Correct. information available? Correct. It's doing a lot, so it tends to be very chatty. Right, and you're also wasting resources because you're consuming, you know, CPU and network yeah, bandwidth every, every time. Question. When yeah, when yeah, and it does add up, you know, from a cost point of view, mm -hmm. especially, you know, when you have to handle thousands of transactions a day, right. the event rate can can mm -hmm. you know save you quite a bit of money by only you know. Uh, getting active on uh, events that come in. Excellent. Are you using that in, for some of your customers? Yes, we are using it for one of our customers where we integrate the, the, the uh, they have a remote uh, Postgres database and there are events or, well, triggers that happen on the database mm -hmm. that get routed to an Azure function. From an Azure function, they get routed to an event grid. Okay. And then from an event grid, we route it to uh, an Azure Kubernetes cluster where each, each cluster is hosting a pod, and the pod has Docker containers that have uh, the Linux application. So Azure gives you all of this. That I just rattled off a whole series of you, you technologies, did. I was, I was but, big, but the, pictures in my head as you. But the that. amazing part about <laughs> Azure is, you know, with uh, Azure Kubernetes services, uh, you're able to host uh, uh, multiple pods that are, you know, uh, highly available. You can route to any different pod. Each pod can have one or more Docker containers, and the Docker container can run. Uh, Linux, it can run, you know, a Windows Server, it can run any one of those things. And, uh, and uh, again, it, you know, a lot of these are, you could look at, uh, you know, the container as something like a virtual machine. Right. Um, but it's much more efficient than a virtual machine. The whole container technology is much more efficient than, than a virtual machine. So, there's an amazing amount of technology available mm -hmm. in Azure that allows us to build some pretty unique solutions that we couldn't do before. Yeah, I think a container is basically a small slice Correct. of a virtual machine. So Correct, it exactly. It starts up more quickly, it consumes less resources, and it's uh, isolates from the rest of the virtual machine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is cool. So I, had, I, I think back to my early days of learning software development, and I was trying to uh, modularize my code, you know, so it was it's easier to maintain. And now we've taken that a step further. We've actually modularized the deployment of specific application or pieces of the application. Uh, right. To different parts of the cloud, or maybe even different clouds. Exactly, that's maybe different cloud. With, a lot of things are with, yeah, with Docker, it allows you to do that too. Yeah, well. also with uh, the, the the whole pub sub model, where I've got exactly. my piece over here doing something, and then asynchronously, I can just drop a message or fire an event or something, right. so that something later on can pick it up and finish exactly. the process. I have a completely isolated process doing that. Exactly. Uh, it's it's very cool. And the space you go versus you know. And it can be a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah, it can be a lot cheaper. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, is there anything that uh, you want to talk about that we haven't yet? No, I think uh, you know. I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, some of the things I'm passionate about, yeah. and uh, you know, look forward to having you come and speak at our future events. And 
you know, this event was successful because of Microsoft's participation. You know, you and uh, Dick Ashish Chaladi and Sanjeev Garg from Microsoft all helped us put this event together and really appreciate you spending a Saturday with us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I used to do a lot more speaking. I don't do that much anymore, so it's a treat for me to come back here. Very good. Jada, thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. I, I've been uh, working with technology uh, for a, a long time, and what never ceases to amaze me is, you know, the number of friends I've made over the years because of this. And uh, it, it is it is absolutely um, satisfying in my career to have the ability to um, not only work with some of the newer technologies that are out there, but also make new friends based on you know, uh, some of the projects that we work together on or, you know, some of the events uh, like we had today where we get to meet um, and uh, build on our friendships that uh, have lasted a lot of years. But the common thread in all of this is our passion for technology.